guys and welcome back to Candid Conversations. Thank you so much for coming back to us once again here at your hub of consciousness. My name is Tandu Somi, the founder of Candid Conversations and today I am back with another installment of Behind the Blog where I get behind the blog and talk about why I wrote a blog that I wrote, what it means and the message that I was trying to at least portray or, or talk about in that blog. If you want to know which blog I chose, please do stay tuned for the rest of this video but before we get into the video i need to remind you to subscribe subscribe i honestly don't know what you're waiting for maybe you're waiting for jesus to come back or something to happen but make sure you do subscribe so you can stay up to date with every single piece of content that we upload and um, subscribe on our website as well as our youtube channel and really be a part of the candid conversations family now that that's out of the way let's get into this for today's rendition of Behind the Blog, I chose a blog that I published yesterday on the 2nd of December titled 16 Days of Activism. And the question that I was asking is, are we creating environments that perpetuates gender-based violence? As you all know, we are currently in the season of 16 Days of Activism against violence towards women. This has been a project and a season that has been running for the longest of times. But it is sad that even though we have these days, spread awareness and to really advocate for women who cannot advocate for themselves or speak for themselves. We hear news every single day of a woman being murdered, of a woman being abused. We hear shocking conviction rates when it comes to, you know, rapist trials. And it seems as if, although we have these seasons and time, any tangible results that we can look at and say, these seasons have made an actual difference. But I do believe that awareness is better than nothing. We have to have these conversations to keep the vision and the mission alive of creating a world that is ultimately safe for every single woman and girl child. So I think that the 16 Days of Activism is, is a campaign that needs to be executed every single year up until we reach the point as a society when we can say we've done our bit to ensure that women and girls are safe in their surrounding areas. But back to the blog, which I'm going to be talking about today, I want to reiterate the question that I posed in the blog. And the question was, are we creating environments that perpetuate gender-based violence? Um, about two days ago, I was in Johannesburg and I met up with a good friend of mine and he spoke about gender-based violence and different solutions that we could come up with. And it was a very, very interesting conversation. And it was good to know that there are people and young people who are out there thinking about solutions that we can implement to ensure that gender-based violence is really eradicated from, from South Africa, Africa and the global community as a whole. And in that conversation, I realized how we are putting up all of these outcomes based solutions to a problem that is inherently fundamental to how society functions and it, it's quite difficult to difficult to place a outcomes based approach to something that really needs us to examine the inputs and what was used to create the outcomes that we have already you know i almost liken it to putting a plate on top of a bursted water pipe that won't actually make any difference because there'll still be water spewing out um, from all angles. I had to really ask myself the question of since we have a society that still produces members of its of its constituency that think it's okay to rape and think it's okay to abuse women, how can we change society in such a way that we produce people who actually respect women and people who actually see women as equals and people who uphold the dignity of women? So I believe that no one wakes up randomly and says, today I want to go rape somebody or today I want to implement a policy in my company that says women will earn less money than men. No one, you know, wakes up one day and says, I'm going to start a human trafficking. No one wakes up one day and says, I'm going to deny my daughter an education because I believe boys deserve an education. Somehow those people were conditioned and they grew up in environments that affirmed and promoted and advocated for sexist and, 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 and ideas that are based on the premise of gender inequality. And I think those are the things we need to attack, especially in this time and season of the 16th days of activism. I did mention in the blog that convicting one rapist is a victory in itself, but we need to ask ourselves, what 
environment, what home, what background did that person come from that ultimately conditioned them to think that the crime that they were committing in that moment was okay. And so that's why I think it's so important to ask ourselves, what environments are these young men coming from as a society? And how can we contribute to homes being a place where women are nurtured and women are respected? Um, and how can communities become, you know, areas like that? And I think my first port of just reference for, for this discussion on how we can create environments where you know gender-based violence is not perpetuated it's actually looking at environments where those gender-based violence is perpetuated and i sought out to look at social systems in our world that fundamentally put women at a place that is below men just because they're born with female private parts um, and it's sad that in a world where we say that all people are made equal before the eyes of god there still are certain things that women have a higher chance of being susceptible to because they are just simply women. And it is environments like that that perpetuate gender-based violence and make it, make it okay or make it a norm for men or women sometimes put women in a place of subjugation and docility. And when I thought about this, I thought about the different things I've read about and seen that are direct indications of how social systems that we can create can automatically subject women to unfair situations. The first one is of a tradition in primarily West Africa, countries like Ghana, where young women in families are taken away from their families. And this is done with the consent of the ch of the child's family they take the child away from from her family and they make her a slave to a shrine um who is obviously male and this shrine is said to, shrine is said to be connected to everything that is divine and godly and the shrine has direct powers to god and what happens is if a male in the young girl's family has committed a crime or a sin, what the family does is they offer up their youngest daughter as a sacrifice or a, a, an offering to the shrine because they believe that once this is done, a male member of the family who did commit the crime will suddenly be atoned and forgiven for his sins. And these young girls are taken away from their families and they're made to live with the shrine for probably the rest of their lives in ritual servitude to the shrine. And what they do is they do everything from sex work to domestic chores and just are put in places that are so compromising to their health, to their education, to their development, and to their self-actualization as women. And these girls are taken from a young age of about 13 or 12, and some, some of them stay in these shrines up until you know their 30s and 40s. Some are rescued, some never ever get out. It's an example of a cultural system in West Africa that has been created and creates an environment where men feel like it's okay to rape or take women away from their families or or treat women in a lesser position just because they are female i mean cultural systems have been around for decades but i think the cultural system will always be to the detriment of a female in that system then we need to actually question the whole system in itself because the example of Chokoshi creates an environment where the shrine himself thinks that he has the liberty to command that his enslaved, you know, young girls should have sex with him whenever they want. It's that thing of him thinking that he's superior or, you know, because he's connected to the divine and God, he can suddenly command whatever he may want from the girls that have been away from their families. So I think this is just one example of a social system that creates an environment in the countries where that system is pervasive, that men think that it's okay to do as they please with women. And we need to look at things like that and say, does the existence of this system actually make it okay and the minds of young men for them to rape because they'll know that they'll get away with it or it's just something that women in those areas as well have accepted so i think that's just one example a prime example um of of a system based on patriarchy based on sexism that really creates an environment that perpetuates gender-based violence i'm going to play a short clip done by christine aman paul where she actually went into the field and interviewed girls who were initiates in the Trokoshi system and you'll get a further idea of what i'm talking about and then we'll move on to the next scenario this is ghana west africa 
When I was seven, I was brought to this country and forced into a system I knew nothing about. This is me. I was held as a slave in a religious shrine. What crime is this child paying for? Her uncle committed adultery. Thousands of women across West Africa have lost their freedom because of a practice called trokoshi, and it's still happening. So scenario number two that I thought about reminded me of a book I read last year. It was a true story of a young girl from Nepal who was human trafficked and she became a sex worker right from her teenage years into her early 20s up until she escaped. Her escape was a very, very risk risky one because we do know that once you try and escape that system, the odds of you being murdered and killed or further abused are so, so high. But she managed to escape it. And you know, when I read her story, I realized how the systems that exist that put women in these precarious positions need to be attacked head on. And we need to look at the quilts with which life in society is woven on. But back to the story, the story is of a young woman named Radhika. She was from Nepal and she was born into a poverty-stricken household. And when I say poverty, I mean absolute poverty. Her family relied on sustenance farming for their own food and if they had any surplus, they'd sell it in the local marketplace in Nepal. I mean, it was, I think if I remember correctly from reading the book, there were at least nine or 10 or 11 people living in one little, you know, mud hut. And the situation was just not great at all. And what was worse was the fact that in Nepal, there were systems, social systems that existed. I'm not sure if they still exist today, but at the time of writing of the book, there was a social system that existed that prevented young women from getting an education because the fundamental belief was that men are the ones who should get an education because they will be the ones to care for their families financially and be the leaders of any social, political, or economic system. So automatically, being excluded from the opportunity to better your life and to become somebody else other than you know a domestic servant or a subservient human being those those opportunities and chances were denied for her and so she spent much of her childhood farming at her family's small plots of land and helping her sister sell in the marketplace then there came a time where money was just running low and sustenance farming was not helping and aiding the family to stay alive. And so she made the brave decision to head out into the central business districts of Nepal to access a wider market and to engage in higher degrees of commerce. So she, she would take what her family had farmed um, for that month and go to the marketplace and, and basically sell there and stay there for a week and then come back home. Home to bring back the money. Meanwhile, she could have gone to school, but because patriarchal systems exist, she was denied that opportunity. Now, what happened was where she usually had her store set up in the CBD, there'd be a young gentleman who appeared to be very nice, cordial, very amicable, who'd keep her company on some days and because she was naive, she thought that he just had great intentions. Then one day he approached her and he offered her a job as a domestic worker for a very affluent family in India. He told her that she'd be paid lots and lots of money, she'd live a good life, and she'd make more money than she's making in the marketplace selling fruits and vegetables. Um, without even hesitating or questioning, she took the opportunity and she was so excited to go to India. She thought that a life beyond the borders of Nepal was going to be the greatest thing that ever happened to her. And so she took the opportunity, she headed off to um, India with this guy, and the last thing that she remembered was that on the train to India, the guy gave her a bottle of Coke. She drank the Coke and she was completely knocked out knocked out, she was unconscious, and she was just not aware of where she was. And in the book, to be told that she woke up and she found herself in a cold, dingy, clinical um, hospital bed. And she could feel abdominal pain, but she couldn't understand what caused it. And the doctors around her were people who did not speak her language. So she was in this place all alone, far away from her family. She didn't know what happened to her. She was in pain and she just can't recognize any familiar faces. Up until she learns that 
her kidney was involuntarily removed from her to be donated to this affluent family that was said to be in need of a domestic worker. Meanwhile, they just needed a kidney for the matriarch of the family because she was suffering from an illness. And what they did was they compensated her amount of money and they took her from the hospital to a really dingy apartment in some part of India and still she did not know where she was. When she got to the apartment, the men who were with her took away all that money and they proceeded to her in at least seven years of sex work in India up until she was able to leave home. I mean, during her journey, she was, she was put into an arranged marriage without her permission by people who aren't even her family. She ended up having a child with the guy she was married to and the guy she was married to was incredibly violent. He domestically abused her and was the one who was part and parcel of selling her into sex work. So, you know, when I read the book and tracked down the train of events, it all came back to an environment that is created that perpetuates gender-based violence, that perpetuates the oppression of women, and that really ensures that social systems exist that put women in a precarious and that will leave them solely dependent on men for their well-being. So right from West Africa all the way to Nepal in Asia, these are things that happen in the world and environments that are created that really perpetuate gender-based violence and keep things like human trafficking syndicates going or women away from school, you know? And I just think to myself, if this young lady at 13 was just given the opportunity to get an education, she probably would not have landed up in that marketplace. She probably would have never met that guy who sold her into a life of slavery and took away one of her organs without her permission. All of those events could have been prevented, you know? So when we, when we advocate for the end of gender-based violence, we need to also advocate for an end to systems that deny women around the world for an education. We need to advocate for an end to cultural rituals and systems that lead women feeling oppressed and that put men above women the fundamentally flawed basis of your human anatomy and your biology we need to look at attacking those things head on and then i think we won't have environments that promote gender-based violence you know one thing about human beings is that we like to belong it's very rare to find a human being who would stray from a part that is normal um, we all want to feel like we belong to a group. We all want to feel like we're doing something that is acceptable. And that is, I guess, homogenous with the current precedent that is set by those that come before us and society itself. So we need to ask ourselves that if this is the case, are we creating societies where the norm is to deny your child an education because she's a girl? Are we creating a society where it is the norm to just rape a woman because you feel as if you just have some magical powers bestowed upon you by the divine? Is it okay to create environments where we silence women who want to report a case, but because their dignity is going to be stripped and they're just going to be filled with shame, they choose to retreat and leave the rapist to go on to his next victim? You know, is it okay to create environments where young girls and families speak out about their uncles who rape them, yet families say they mustn't utter a word because it's going to ruin the reputation of that family in the community. The more we have those things and normalize those responses to gender-based violence, the more it's going to affirm to young men that what they're doing is okay and it should be continued. And the more it's going to reaffirm to women who have subscribed to the dogma and the constructs of patriarchy to continue to also be enablers of patriarchy because men and women can be guilty of both of those crimes. I mean, majority of brothels run in India are actually headed by women who are called madams of the brothel and they manage the, the continuous suppression and abuse of their female workers, you know? So these are the things that we need to look at and attack head on. I think society has a mission and an accountability factor and responsibility to question why it is 
producing members of its constituencies that can commit these crimes and what we can do to change the narrative, change the conversations, change the way families are raised, destroy systems of human trafficking and denying young girls an education and using women as weapons of war. And once we start asking ourselves, I think long lasting sustainable solutions will be made because we'll know that in 10 years from now, we're going to be producing men and women who look at women differently and who afford women the opportunity to be respected. So that was it on Behind the Blog for the blog I published yesterday, again titled 16 Days of Activism, Are We Creating Environments That Perpetuate Gender-Based Violence? What I want to say in this season is, may we take the extra efforts to create a safe South Africa and Africa and global community for every single young woman that exists. May we take this time to examine ourselves. May we retreat and really be honest with ourselves if we in any way, shape or form have been custodians of gender-based violence and systems that keep women in positions of oppression. And I think once we all have those honest conversations without judging ourselves, but to see the need to change, that's when we have real, effective, long-lasting and sustainable change all over the world. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this video. I hope to see you next time on another rendition of Behind the Blog and continue to engage with us, like, comment, share and let's continue to have candid conversations. Thank you.